Now, there are a range of alternative learning environments that you may find yourself in. Um, you may be teaching in a school of distance education, teaching virtually, online. There may be another pandemic where we need to do more um, online teaching. Or there may be other experiences where you do partially online and partially um, in-person learning. And we call that uh, blended or hybrid learning. Now, in hybrid learning, you have some students online and some students face-to-face. -face. For example, you might have some students on an excursion or traveling internationally. Or you might have some students um, that are ill but still want to attend your class virtually. Or you may be in a school where students are permitted to attend online and also attend on campus. So you may find yourself, and increasingly likely to find yourself, um, teaching in an online mode and in hybrid mode, and also what we call blended mode. This is where you may be teaching both, where part of your course may be online and part of it in person. Now, the most popularized version of this is what's called flipped learning. And you're experiencing that in this course, where you have the asynchronous material, the material that's been done not live, um, that you engage with first. So these videos and the readings and the course material. And then in the live experience, the on-campus experience or the in-person experience, or what we call the synchronous experience, where it's done all together at the same time, the time is then spent unpacking the material that you work through in an asynchronous mode. The course discussion is more facilitated in a synchronous mode, whereas engaging with content is better facilitated in an uh, asynchronous mode, where you can pause things and you can take your time and progress through the material at your own pace. So we call that blended learning. So there are a range of different strategies and methods for engaging with online learning. And I provided you with a list of those. <coughs> There's video lectures, um, interactive activities, online readings, virtual labs, um, a whole range of different tools and techniques that you can utilize. Um, but also just one-to-one -one engagement through direct video conferencing. Um, that's increasingly being done with uh, parent-teacher uh, meetings. So instead of having the parents have to attend to the school and disrupt their schedules and so forth, being able to video conference and discuss um, students' progress in a one-to-one -one, uh, video conference is becoming common. And even parent-teacher, more formal parent-teacher conferences where often we'd have all the parents come along, or as many as can, and you would go through and you explain each of your students' um, progress. Increasingly, that is being done using a hybrid mode where some attend on campus and some attend virtually. So there's a range of benefits from online and hybrid and blended learning approaches. <coughs> Most importantly is the flexibility that it provides so that we can do things in different ways and we can accommodate different um, necessities, be it student disabilities or traveling or illnesses, things of that nature. It also increases the accessibility. So some students that might have vision impairment or hearing impairments, um, if we're doing things with more technological based, we can often use those technologies to help overcome some of those uh, challenges. There's also sometimes personalization where we can differentiate more, where you can provide different content for different students. Um, in a live face-to-face -face environment, that can often be difficult. Of course, you're dealing with a whole range of students at once. Um, in an online or blended mode or hybrid mode, you can often have different material pre-prepared for different students. And you've got a longer time to prepare and present material in that format. And that can allow more individualization and personalization. Sometimes it can be more cost effective, um, particularly when you're at universities. Uh, where we're often dealing with hundreds of students, doing an online presentation can be more, um, more effective. So, for example, that's why lecture theatres were developed. Of course, it was more cost effective than having smaller group instruction. So there are some benefits in that respect around um, these approaches. And finally, 
it can be also more collaborative. Um, being able to work in online groups and work asynchronously, um, so when everyone doesn't have to uh, be together at once, can allow for different forms of collaborative learning. And it can also allow sometimes more access to resources, particularly when those resources may be limited. Um, so you may only have, say, enough uh, virtual reality headsets for, or physical uh, devices for particular activities. But if you're doing things online, that tends to be much more um, resource flexible. So having your students access an online database generally doesn't matter how many students you have, they can all access that online database. Whereas if you're using physical equipment, you're constrained by the number of physical items that you have. So there's a range of different benefits then that you can find from online hybrid and blended learning. Uh, there can though sometimes be some disadvantages and we do need to consider those. Um, having a lack of face-to-face -face interaction can uh, reduce a relationship building and that's probably one of the key problems of online learning. But there are strategies and techniques to overcome that, particularly over time when you've got students in an um, ongoing year-long relationship with, uh, and you're developing those relationships, there are different strategies that you can build around that. Probably the biggest one is allowing time for um, personal conversations, talking about their day, talking about their interests, things that you might do with students in a face-to-face -face environment off the cuff that often we feel as though we can't do in an online environment, but we can. We can still have those interactions just because it's through a, uh, a technology mediated communication doesn't mean it has to be a formal communication and there may be times when you set up playing games or just having fun activities and doing that through an online space in order to build those relationships uh, there can be technical issues uh, students having internet issues or other technical issues can have impediments to online um, teaching and learning. There may be limited options for hands-on activities. So while there may be some great opportunities to use virtual technologies like online databases and things of that nature and virtual worlds and so forth, the lack of ability to use say physical robots or virtual reality equipment can be um, an impediment when we're using online learning. Sometimes there can be a lack of structure um, in a face-to-face -face environment, you know all the students are there and everything happens in a much more structured way and you can control that. In an online environment, a student getting up and going and doing something, you don't have an awful lot of control over that. Um, there can be disruptions and, and things that uh, you've got to accommodate a more flexible approach to what's occurring in your extended classroom when engaging with online learning. And we've talked about limited social interaction and there's also teacher workload. Um, developing and managing online environments does take a lot more effort and a lot more work than face-to-face -face environments. In a face-to-face -face class, you can turn up almost unprepared and sort of bluff your way through and manage a learning experience. In an online environment where you're expected to have pre-prepared material and to prepare video presentations and so forth, that takes a lot of additional effort. Uh, particularly if you um, are more of a perfectionist. Of course, there's the idea that you can just keep redoing a presentation until you get it just perfect. But of course, that can take a huge amount of time. And you can't do that in a face-to-face -face classroom. You've got one go at it, um, so that sort of forces you to be able to accept uh, the quality of the work that you present in a class. Online learning, of course, is the opportunity to do it again until it's just perfect there's a tendency for some to, um, to try that. But you can quickly become overwhelmed in terms of the work intensity and workload involved in doing so. And then there are some classroom management issues related to online learning. You've got less physical control. So one of the techniques around classroom management is called physical presence. If a student is about to become disruptive or has started being disruptive, just going and physically being near them can often diffuse that. And as an effective teacher, 
you'll learn to be able to anticipate disruptions well before even students are thinking about doing them. Um, of course, you see certain cues or you know certain environments where that's likely to occur with certain students. And simply by moving your, and positioning yourself in certain locations, you can disrupt that behavior from occurring. In an online space, that can be a little bit more difficult. Not impossible though, as you start becoming more experienced with a learning environment and picking up on certain cues and knowing when certain things are likely to happen, you can then sort of initiate certain activities or um, start certain conversations to gear things in different ways. But it is a, a different skill set to the physical presence um, capacity in a, a more traditional classroom environment. Uh, building community and building those relationships does take a, a bit longer in online environments and can be a bit more complex, um, but it's certainly something that still needs to be done. Uh, creating resources in an organized way and presenting it to them. If you present a whole lot of resources that are in a confusing way, like all in one big folder or on a website where things are hidden away in different places, um, students won't appreciate that and that can cause disruptions. You need to be present. Um, so just, just presenting in a... Uh, online environment is just as bad as just presenting in a face-to-face -face environment. You need to engage with your students to know that you're engaging with them. You're not just coming in, doing a presentation and then leaving. You're engaging with them and you're making it interactive. You're allowing them to ask questions. You're questioning them. You're making it a positive, proactive learning experience, be it online or in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, Setting norms and expectations are just as important as a face-to-face -face environment. Um, engaging with conversations. One tendency with online is to um, ignore difficult conversations and difficult aspects, which could then uh, become problems. So address students' concerns. Um, ask them about any difficulties they're having. Try and work out what those difficulties are and explore them and um, resolve those with the students just as you would in a face-to-face -face environment. And use various means to stay in contact and stay in communication, including in schools with parents. Uh, online technologies allow us to stay in contact with parents, in some cases more than we want. Um, some parents do abuse that facility and the what we call helicopter parents, which are wanting to be overly involved in the decision-making around students' learning you can allow that to a certain extent, but you then very strongly need to enforce your professional role as their teacher. Um, you don't have to follow what parents want. Uh, they don't have the right to demand different pedagogies, and different structures of different learning. Certainly you're welcome to um, listen to their suggestions and allow them to present those suggestions, but feel under no compulsion whatsoever to adopt what they suggest. Um, that said, it's always polite to listen to them and, and so forth. But that one technique around that is to actually involve them. Um, use them as a guest speaker. Get them involved in projects as a, part, as a client or as a reviewer and an evaluator at the end of the project and actually allow them to be participating in students' learning experiences in a positive way without them impacting upon the, the decisions you make as a professional teacher on how the learning is going to occur. That they don't have the right to do so. And you do need to be tactful in those aspects that the school will stand behind you, uh, almost always. Sometimes there are certain parents that are so influential within a school that it can be politically complicated. But in the main, you are the professional. You need to be acknowledged as that by your students and by the parents. And sometimes parents can um, conflict with that. They need to accept that you are the, um, the expert in teaching and learning. And even though they might not agree with your decisions around how students should be learning, you need to set the expectations for your parents that they will support you and they won't try to undermine you with the students because that is then going to be disruptive and detrimental to the student's learning. So sometimes parents will see a different perspective, say if they're a programming professional, and they feel that you should be teaching 
students a particular aspect of coding in a different way or to a different level. You need to be very firm with them and say no, as an expert in K-12 computer education, you are teaching in this way because you have made that decision to do so. And while you can appreciate that they may have different perspectives, they shouldn't be undermining your authority and your expertise with the students because of some perception that they have of there's a different way of doing it. So these are issues that you'll experience as a teacher and you'll gain um, expertise in working with parents. Of course, it can be just as complicated as working with students. Um, depending upon the school culture and so forth. But there's also times when you want to engage with parents and they are disengaged. And sometimes that can be challenging as well. So lots of things to develop as a teacher around these capabilities.